Uh, let's get started. So today we're going to be talking about uh, an incident that happened uh, at, uh, to one of our customers uh, about a year ago. Um, and I thought it was um, important to share the details of the incident and um, hopefully share with the community and hopefully we can prevent those kind of incidents from occurring at our own companies. So um, just a quick uh, introduction. Uh, thank you for the intro, uh, Lauren. Um, but uh, I currently work at the Cloud Health um, Technologies company that's um, um, focused on managing uh, cost and governance across multiple uh, cloud environments. And my main responsibility is mostly security and compliance now, uh, although I did start it in technical operations, DevOps, uh, et cetera. Um, as uh, Lauren mentioned, I also do a little bit of car racing on the side, and uh, uh, I juggle and do some acro stuff. Uh, it's part of a circus community here in Boston. Um, so how many of you guys are familiar with uh, cryptocurrency? Just if you don't mind raising your hands. Okay, all right, it's a pretty big uh, uh, crowd. And uh, how many actually uh, lost money <laughs> recently on cryptocurrencies? <laughs> all right, it's pretty embarrassing thing to admit, but thank you for sharing that. Um, what I want to point out is, um, you know, the crypto jack uh, in and out of itself is uh, a way to leverage uh, somebody else's commute, compute um, uh, resources uh, to mine cryptocurrencies. Um, and there's a variety of ways of doing it uh, nowadays. Uh, you can do it through browsers uh, in JavaScript. You can do it on your home routers or your personal laptops. Um, uh, but you can also leverage um, physical resources in uh, data centers and also cloud environments. So it's pretty pervasive. Um, things like, for example, Pirate Bay recently had a, a JavaScript that was uh, Bitcoining uh, Monero, uh, bit mining uh, Monero. Um, and it happens uh, to real companies as well. Uh, most recently in this, uh, in this year in particular, uh, Tesla was in the news uh, recently. Um, uh, they've um, had apparently an open Kubernetes cluster that somebody leveraged to deploy um, containers and, and run Bitcoin mining operations in their uh, cloud environments. Same thing happened with insurance provider in UK, uh, Aviva, and uh, Jamalto uh, as well. And most of those are due to leaked uh, AWS credentials. However, I want to point out that many of those things um, go unreported. Uh, like, you know, it's a pretty embarrassing thing to admit that um, uh, your account's been uh, hijacked for crypto mining operations. And it's not like a data breach where you have to uh, report it to authorities, et cetera. So a lot of those things, um, because they're embarrassing, they don't get reported um, out in public. The thing, for example, like about the AWS elite credentials and account takeovers, um, is a pretty serious thing where it can potentially um, destroy the company. Um, in 2014, if uh, any of you remember, there was a company called Code Spaces uh, where their root account, AWS account, got compromised um, and the person that took over that account uh, demanded ransom, that was, which was not paid. And essentially, because the company was completely based in the cloud, um, the hijacker uh, destroyed the company, including the backups and everything else. So speaking of, uh, setting up proper DS strategy. So the company had to uh, close shop because they had no way to recover the data, their customer's data, their own data. So it could be serious. <clears throat> so let's, let's talk about the incident itself and the timeline. Um, we, about a year ago, you know, this, this event happened, uh, we got a support email uh, to, our, to our support personnel uh, essentially stating that, hey, we discovered that we have about 200 instances running um, in our AWS account um, across multiple regions, and they were generating about $12,000 um, a month in EC2 compute cost. Um, the customer stated that they didn't have any CloudTrail uh, enabled and absolutely no audit logs uh, of how it happened. But they did notice is that one of the uh, accounts, uh, IAM user, um, that was typically given read-only permissions, all of a sudden had admin rights. So um, they, they sent us this email hoping that we can help them investigate um, because you know, we do monitor our customers' accounts and uh, we do have some data on them. So as a part of the handling this incident, uh, they obviously reached out to AWS support. Um, AWS um, had them completely, thoroughly clean out their AWS account that was um, uh, affected by this. They just right away, a little bit too late now, uh, enabled CloudTrail in that account to capture uh, the audit data 
Um, and then they worked with the customer on the, on the refund. Again, the refund part is uh, case dependent, um, you're kind of at the mercy of AWS um, on this. And what we did on our side, um, because our platform essentially uh, captures the state of the account um, at like 15 minute in intervals, uh, we went through our database backups at like certain point of time to reestablish the timeline of what exactly happened during the incident. And I'm gonna go into the details of that timeline uh, a little bit on. But we also configured our uh, Cloud Health platform to help customers to monitor for those kind of things, uh, the security module on that platform, and then some of the best practices in terms of cost reporting and cost spike reporting like this. So um, the timeline part, uh, this is where it's interesting. So uh, it happened around March, um, and what we found out that there was a series of uh, AMIs uh, created throughout the world in multiple regions and there were publicly shared AMIs, uh, Windows-based. And uh, what we noticed that when we're doing forensics is that the first thing that happened um, during the incident is that one of the users in the environment had uh, admin privileges, their access key, you know, the Amazon has two slots, right, AWS one key and two, their access key one got rotated. Um, and right following that, our platform started detecting other changes like the user that was affected that was read-only supposedly was giving admin rights and console access, et cetera. Uh, but then immediately following that, uh, we started seeing multiple resources around the world, multiple regions, uh, started getting created. And uh, you could see that in terms of the span, all those activities happen in less than 10 minutes. Right, and then we started detecting that, hey, uh, 200 or so uh, Windows, um, C, C4 actually, C4, 8X roll edge Windows machines uh, starting getting detected. We started getting collecting, collecting the performance metrics of those machines and we immediately started seeing 100% CPU utilization across the board on all of them. And then the day later, a customer kind of discovered the uh, spike in cost in their AWS account. So a couple of things I want to point out on this timeline um, is that for us, the majority of the data about like changes in IAM and permissions uh, came from uh, one particular report um, called Generate Credentials Report. In that report, we were able to exact, exactly establish the timeline of when the user uh, credential got changed, when the user permissions got changed, when things changed on, the, on that particular account. Um, another thing I wanna point out is that, um, I don't know if you noticed that the first operations that we saw, right, um, was that access key one got rotated. And uh, does anybody um, think like why that's peculiar or a little bit strange? That why this is the first operations that an attacker would do? Uh, yeah, exactly. Not just you, but if you imagine that um, if you somehow share your credentials, right, those guys are not the only ones looking for them. So not only do they wanna lock you out, but they wanna lock out any, anyone else that's scanning at the same intervals. So it's like the first one um, in wants to lock everybody else out. <clears throat> so another thing I want to point out, it was highly automated, templated. Um, right? They had the pre-baked AMIs already ready to go. All they need to do is spin them up. Um, all the configurations for the AWS accounts, VPC, security groups, NACLs, everything, right? They all got preset uh, and spun up. It was limited to 100 instances. Uh, and this particular reason is because that's the default AWS account limit. <laughs> so <laughs> they probably could have <laughs> spun up a lot more if they could. Um, so that's kind of like the, the, the summary of the timeline. Um, I, I kind of want to um, go into discussion about how we can actually prevent this kind of incidents, right? And those incidents are fairly easy to prevent. Um, Couple of points I wanna point out, like the root account is the most important account uh, that you have in the AWS. Um, you wanna make sure that it's um, locked away uh, in a safe, and the best way to do this is uh, get a physical MFA uh, set up for that root account, disable all and any API access to that account, and just really don't use it at all. That's just the most basic thing you can do. Um, it's a God mode-like account, so treat it, treat it with respect. The second thing, there's type, various types of users that you generally would use in AWS. 
And for typical users and operators, that, um, you know, people that would log into your AWS accounts, there's a couple of things you can do. A, you can enforce the MFA um, on all those um, users and operators. And Amazon provides you this um, amazing IAM policy that you can overlay on any and all your existing IAM policies assigned to a user. And it will just enable MFA and will allow the user to manage their own self-credentials without disrupting anything else you may have set up in your own policies. So it's a very clever policy that they come up with. Uh, by all means, uh, do use it. Um, well, obviously, the MFA works really well for AWS console access. It you know, gives you a little field to put in the uh, one-time token. Um, it, sometimes it's a challenge to use it on the CLI. Um, there's a tool that you can use for CLI, AWS Vault. Um, quite a handy tool. Um, other solutions um, that you may be already using, um, leverage SAML or SSO, um, like Google, Okta, Ping Identity, One Login, um, all good providers for SSO login to your AWS account. So there's no need for actual user in, uh, in AWS. Uh, and some of those are, do provide um, CLI-based tools, um, leveraging the uh, MFA as well. So one last thing there, um, do not give out direct permissions to users. Um, IAM permissions um, ask users to assume role um, that, that they actually need to use in their accounts. So on the application uh, and application services accounts, those are very important. Like obviously a lot of uh, uh, us run services and kind of need to generate AWS credentials for the services to run and operate um, in our cloud environments. Um, but Amazon provides you really good solutions to bypass that, right? Um, you come up with instance profiles that you can sign permissions to instances where you're running your uh, services. Um, and you can le leverage IAM roles um, for those services. Another addition uh, that works, I've seen it work very well uh, in a very contained environment where you exactly know like where uh, the services are running and which IP addresses they're gonna be using. Um, and one of the suggestions I've, I've heard is adding uh, conditional statements to your policies uh, for the service accounts to restrict it to specific IP addresses that you're using for your, for your infrastructure. A um, Couple of other quick pointers, right? Do not ever, <laughs> please, <laughs> well, means give out the, you know, start out star to your uh, service accounts. This is a bad idea. A um, couple of ways to prevent from, if you do have to use um, you know, AWS key and secret key, to prevent it from getting into your source code, especially into public repos. Uh, there are tools out there that can allow you to uh, scan code before it gets committed to your repos. And in some cases, like key nuker, uh, could potentially go and invalidate those keys uh, before they end up on your public um, GitHub repos or Git repos. So um, other suggestions on the, on the general side, on the protection, you know, you know, just keep the default limits. I know uh, a person that by default, whenever they would spin up a new brand new account, would request from AWS uh, those exorbitant limits to like 10,000 instances, 20,000 instances, so it doesn't have to deal with it uh, later. Uh, but in the situation we had before, that, that could have been devastating to the company. Um, there are a couple of benchmarks you can apply to your AWS accounts, and a couple of companies here, like ThreatStack, for example, that are a sponsor of this event, um, they, can, they can help you configure your AWS account to the best practices. Um, and by all means, please, enable CloudTrail um, in, in your configuration. That's the only way you can audit to see what, exactly what's happening in your account. So pretty important. A um, couple of other quick notes. Uh, you, can, you can set up uh, billing alerts directly from your AWS accounts um, and trigger an email warnings whenever you detect um, sudden costs increase or spike. Uh, um, or you can use tools like Cloud Health uh, to configure similar alerts in your environments. Some other points about the uh, CloudTrail monitoring. Uh, the, one of the best practices and part of the well-architected review from AWS they do recommend and mandate now that all your CloudTrail accounts, all your CloudTrail data from multiple accounts should be all dropped into a centralized kind of secure AWS account so it can't be tampered with uh, or accessed by somebody else. And then um, on the real-time monitoring and alerting piece, um, a couple of tools like ThreatStack, SumoLogic, Splunk, all those alerting and monitoring services, um, you can feed CloudTrail data into them and then you can look for like suspicious activity, like for example, the first one that I pointed out, right, where the, the access key got rotated. Um, you can flag those activities and report on them through those alerting and monitoring tools. So 
That's it, one last item there on this particular topic. Um, I did notice, right, because those AMIs were publicly uh, shared from you know, an attacker's AWS accounts, and you typically can determine the provenance of those AMIs that you're using in your infrastructure. Uh, they either be, you know, coming from your um, OS provider like Ubuntu or Red Hat, et cetera, right? So those are kind of static account IDs. Uh, or your own accounts where you're baking your own instances, for example, right? Uh, you know those account IDs, so you can potentially track to see if you have some foreign AMIs being spun up in your accounts as well. So uh, I think that's it. Um, one of the things I want to just make sure that uh, when, you, uh, when you leave um, this conference uh, and you start looking to your account configurations, that you focus on three things, right? Key takeaways that um, I want to make sure that everybody takes into consideration uh, when they go back to, to work. Um, enforcing the MFA on the root account and users, um, essentially, uh, very essential, and it will prevent majority of the attacks. The attack that we saw on our own um, infrastructure when one of the developers committed by mistake uh, the content of the kind of home directory uh, to a public repo, including the you know dot files. Um, a minute later, I, I'm, I kid you not, a minute he committed this uh, data to a public repo. A minute later, after we went back to look at the cloud, cloud trail data, a minute later we saw a denied access request uh, to change the uh, AWS key. It takes a minute from you posting that data to a public repo and somebody tracking it and using it. So MFA prevented this particular attack, right? And the user had pretty pretty significant privileges, right? So uh, essential to enforce the MFA. Um, get rid of AWS key and secret key. Amazon provides you uh, tools and services to for you not to use them at all. It takes a little bit of work, uh, but please uh, do that. Uh, IAM rolls a more secure uh, way of uh, doling out privileges in AWS. And then for the love of God, <laughs> Please, enable CloudTrail. I can't stress that enough. Um, it was painful to reconstruct this whole incident <laughs> by looking at database snapshots like uh, every 30 minutes. Uh, CloudTrail would have made it so much easier. Uh, all the data is in there. So that's it. Um, thank you, guys. Uh, so with 200 instances for about, what, six, seven days, uh, yeah. do you have any estimates for what the profit of that attack was? <laughs> A, a year, well, it was, it was March uh, last year, so I assume at, at the time it was uh, quite significant. I mean, it's essentially free money, right? Um, I, I, the fact that we still don't know exactly which type of currency was used, it could have been Monero, Bitcoin, it could be uh, Ethereal, um, there's, there's no indication of which one it was, but I know for sure that it definitely was not like protein folding that they were computing on those things. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thanks for that. That was great. Um, what do you get a sense of how automated these attacks are? Like how much how much of this human seeing vulnerability and pressing a button, or if it's just like troves of bots roving the internet, automatically setting up machines? I believe it's uh, highly automated. Um, and there's, if you look at the timeline, there there was a you know obviously the attackers are prepped for it, so they already have pre-bundled AMIs baked um, all over the regions. And um, they, as soon as they discover the credentials that they can use, um, within 10 minutes you can expect that you're going to have infrastructure running in your environment, um, uh, mining, mining Bitcoin or cryptocurrency or other. Highly automated. Um, I don't know exactly what was used in automation. Uh, if we had CloudTrail logs, it would have been probably easier. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I suspect something like Terraform CloudFormation templates or just straight API uh, calls. Hey, uh, good presentation. Uh, what about MFA on mobile devices like Google Authenticator? Is that fine? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you could use it for your root account as well. It makes it a little bit less secure. Um, but for the users, mobile um, MFA is perfectly fine. Thanks. What, what's your advice about robot accounts? Uh, robot accounts, you mean and MFA. Uh, service accounts? No, like AWS accounts that are not human people automation accounts. Um, I, I think IP whitelisting restrictions or um, giving out spe very specific privileges for the robot accounts to be able to do its work uh, typically works. Um, I, you know, 
key, secret key, uh, again, um, I made a recommendation to not use them at all. Um, Amazon allows you to set up a trust uh, between AWS accounts using IAM roles. Uh, by all means, use that. Uh, that is the safest, most secure way of giving some other account in AWS, giving access to your uh, policies or, or resources. Um, I'm kind of curious because you talked a lot about the financial cost of when it happened. They had any instances spun up, but from the time they contacted support mm -hmm. and got everything wiped and no one was really accessing the account, mm -hmm. what was the logistical cost of them of how long until they were able to actually legitimately use their account again, get in there and start mm -hmm. pushing out builds and making progress on what they were expecting to be doing? Yeah. In this particular case, um, um, the customer in question had about thousands of AWS accounts. Um, and it was only one of the accounts that got compromised. It was a development account with very little things in it. Um, it literally had like five or so uh, IAM users and no resources at all. So for them, the cost of cleanup was, or time to get it back uh, was negligible. But I can suspect that for other customers, it could be a, a major headache, right? Because you need to audit and check absolutely everything, right? To make sure that uh, um, nothing else got changed or hijacked. Somebody didn't create another AWS account uh, with kind of backdoor privileges um, in it. So it could be, could be costly and time consuming. What was the fallout like for your team when your developer committed his home directory to a public repo? <laughs> 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 yeah, um, just a side story. Um, we use Slack uh, quite heavily. And uh, you know the developer had, uh, along with his own data in his home directory, had a, a Slack token that was used for some of the integration work. And uh, Slack token, if you've seen it, it has a very specific set of characters at the beginning. Um, so it's very detectable. And about 10 minutes after you committed uh, to the GitHub repo, uh, we got an email from uh, Slack Zendesk uh, notifying <laughs> that they've detected and invalidated their own token. And they provided a link where they discovered it. And um, upon looking at it, I'm, I'm like, oh, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I see the guy's name, GitHub, public repo, and I'm seeing a whole bunch of other files that should not be there. <laughs> and um, it was panic mode, trying to call the person up. Um, obviously, it's his own private repo. I can't do anything about it. Um, but I finally got hold of him and we started doing the cleanup effort. Um, and then during the investigation, right, when we're looking at the cloud, our own CloudTrail data, um, we quickly determined that whatever credentials he had uh, for AWS in his own uh, repository, um, got rejected, essentially, because of the two-factor authentication. So by all means, <laughs> set up two-factor. And the policy that AWS, the, the one I provided, makes it so much easier. Just It's an overlay that snaps right in uh, over existing uh, policies and roles and makes it much more secure. Just going back to MFA real quick. So yeah. you know how some password managers, like 1Password, let you save the MFA token into the vault. Mm -hmm. And I know that sometimes people I've talked to in security say that they're not a fan of that kind of feature mm -hmm. because then when they try to take down someone's access, they might still have a copy of that URL. So I guess what's your opinion on people who try to get around mm -hmm. the multi of the MFA like, it, it's, and it's, use one device? It, it's hard to um, get around the multi-factor authentication because the user identity itself is um, stored and managed in AWS. So if you disable that user in there, they don't have access anymore. Um, but in terms of um, using the on the endpoint kind of MFA generated tools, um, you're essentially downgrading yourself to a single factor, right? You're typing in your password on the same machine where you have that token uh, being displayed. If somebody has access to your machine, key logger, screenshots, they essentially can get access right from your machine, just being on your machine. Having it on a separate device, uh, mobile device, um, is essential. Just keep it separated. Uh, can you please give more detail or examples on how the keys and secret keys can be abused or misused? Um, well, the worst one I pointed out was um, when the company got completely obliterated and destroyed. Um, that's the worst case scenario. Um, I want to make sure that everybody realizes that you know storing your data in a single cloud or single AWS account is not safe. They want to make sure that you have exit strategy backups going somewhere else in a separate S3 bucket uh, in a completely standalone separate AWS account. Um, you can set up the you know, S3 bucket to S3 bucket replication uh, to avoid that. Um, there's, there are multiple ways of, um, other ways of abusing uh, those key and secret key. Obviously, uh, data breaches, right? Um, 
Tesla, in this particular case, and uh, one of the examples I gave, had an open Kubernetes uh, cluster running in their kind of development account, and the Kubernetes cluster had a couple of workloads running on them uh, that exposed uh, certain secrets in the environment variables, um, including uh, key and secret key, that then was used by the attackers to go and forge the S3 buckets that belong to that account. So we're able to access data uh, that was related to um, uh, car metrics data uh, for the, used for development purposes. So it, it ranges, you know, from obviously something like crypto mining, right, to uh, high, hijacking data, uh, or using it for uh, to stage another attack on somebody else, um, or completely destroying a company and holding a company for ransom. How do you recommend handling service account access from containers? if you're not using environment variables or secret key access key? Um, it depends where you're running the containers. A lot of the, um, you know, like for example, Kubernetes um, allows you to, if you're running on top of EC2, for example, right, allows you to leverage and dole out specific permissions uh, from the instance profile to the pods or services. We're running this um, um, Cube2 IAM or something like that. This is, uh, there's a um, plugin that yeah, it allows you to leverage uh, IAM roles that are doled out to the instances, so you don't have to store the key and secret key in them. Cool, and that's all the time we have. Thanks again, Anton. Awesome. Right. Give him a round of applause again. Thank you. Thank you.